Good morning, Oak Bluff Bible Church. How's everybody doing? I hope uh, you're doing okay, staying healthy and focused and still have things to do. You read a couple books and uh, done a lot of exercising, kept yourself focused in life when the circumstances are sort of interesting and uncertain. So, yeah, I'm reaching out to you as a pastor to just to encourage you and uh, your faith would be remain strong and with full assurance uh, regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in right now I want to thank rob for sharing his testimony and uh, next week we'll be uh, privileged to hear lauren or i uh, she will sh she will be sharing her faith story as well and uh, so if you sense god is uh, doing something in your life even now during this time uh, you know, um, we'd love to hear that. If there's particular verses of Scripture that have come alive and how they have applied and intersected with your life, that would be great to be able to plug into that. And so uh, please uh, do, uh, you know, uh, pass that information on to me and we'll slot you in. So record that and send it to Darla. And so we'd love to hear from you as well. The uh, Wednesday night Bible studies uh, on Zoom have been going very well, and so meaningful time of prayer has been spent. And uh, interestingly enough, for just for your information, uh, on Friday nights, Connie and I are also doing a Bible study uh, with our Mexican brothers and sisters there. And last night was the privilege of a, a lady accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. So. Yeah, God is at work and he's using the circumstances, the uncertainties, and uh, people are coming to faith. So in our present situation globally, uh, anxiety, doubt, and fear uh, definitely are a real issue. People are struggling with their, their, uh, their uh, health, uh, mental health. Depressions uh, are there. Um, just not being able to get out. It seems like spring is forever and coming, and so that probably also causes for this overwhelming feeling. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention this morning in our <clears throat> devotional or prayer uh, uh, message time just to uh, the disciples in their struggle. Um, it seems the Easter season is so short and uh, I'd like to just look at how they struggled with meeting up with the, uh, the risen Lord. It just seemed to be an issue that was hard to overcome and one understands that uh, it's not just every day that uh, somebody arises from the dead. And so in this particular passage of scripture that we want to be looking at, Mark's gospel and also in John's gospel, uh, we just really find repeatedly that the disciples were struggling with their, their beliefs about the risen Lord. And Jesus chides them. Jesus just really challenges them uh, you know, to believe. And I think today Christ as well is just encouraging us to believe, trust him. Yeah, the psalmist David says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. He recognized it, that God was our helper, ever-present comfort and strength in this time. So if you do have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn to Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel probably was the first one to be written. And uh, so Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 9 through 14. And just take note of uh, the, the struggles uh, that they had uh, in accepting the, the risen Lord. And I want to talk a little bit about that, some of the issues that are swirling around in society today as well, some of the responses to Jesus' resurrection and why people don't want to believe it or some of the excuses they put forward. So let's jump in. Uh, Mark 16, verse 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest but they did not believe them either. And later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had been risen. 
So this was not something that they had anticipated. This was not something that they had just conjured up, that he had risen from the dead, a story you lying that, you know, a fable or something that they want to promote and make a big, uh, you know, strong institution out of. This was just uh, not palatable at all. They just could not wrap their minds around it. John's Gospel as well picks up on some of this struggle. And uh, John 20, verse 19. And so I'll be reading that as well. And so uh, Jesus appears to his disciples here in John uh, 20, verse 19. And we'll be reading it until the end of the chapter. So on the evening of the first day, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And afterward he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus says, peace be with you. Again, it just seems to indicate how significant it is to believe in the resurrected Lord in order to have peace. And so peace be with you. It's a prevailing peace. It's, it's just a serenity. It's, it's a shalom that is with us who believe. And so not necessarily that circumstances, but there's an inner peace. It's peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with life. And so again, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now, as another person comes on the scene. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus first came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was there with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger right here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And that was the phrase that caught my attention, so I've entitled my message exactly that. Stop doubting and believe. And so much of life is our thinking. And if we have faith and we believe and, and think proper thoughts, uh, following the thoughts of God, God's intentions, the plans that he has for us, it's amazing how life comes uh, and gains a different perspective, that his kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. And when we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, it's amazing how life changes when we change, uh, look at that perspective. And God steps in. So Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And that's what God longs for us to bring us to that particular point where we can say, my Lord and my God. And he says that to Jesus. <clears throat> so he fully recognizes that Jesus is Lord and he is God. He's the first one to publicly state that there's uh, the Lordship and God is, uh, is sovereign and manifest in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so blessed means, you know, there's, there's something special about that as well. To be able to come to that place, but then also to live a life in the present, right now where we are at. Blessed are you and I who have not seen the risen Lord and yet have believed. And Peter picks up on that motif, that thought. And he says in 1 Peter 1, 8, he says, You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. So that is possible. That was uh, written to people that had been dispersed uh, all over the world because of their faith. And people came down hard on those that were followers of Jesus Christ. 
And uh, so we find peace is something that comes with that. Peter talks about love. He talks about joy. He talks about an inexpressible joy. And yet you rejoice. Uh, you know, there is a sense of rejoicing in this journey. So the purpose of the writing, of course, uh, John says that the resurrection really is one more sign. It's another miracle. It's just that we would come to believe. So Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this term life really has sense of eternal life. The moment that you accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, as Thomas did here, that moment we then receive eternal life. We, we've got the confidence that nothing is, is, is really shakable. You know, we have this eternal life. Even if we die and we're, you know, the outside shell is taken kind of thing, but we have the confidence that God is alive. He'll see us through. He'll see us through. So the whole idea of the resurrection is paramount. It's, it's where the Christian faith you know, sort of pivots on. And in the Nicene Creed, which is something that uh, believers um, wrote out what there were foundational statements of faith, Christian belief. And so there is a line in it that says, on the third day, he rose again. So it declares that three days after Jesus' uh, uh, Jesus' death on the cross, he was resurrected and a glimmer of the eternal life that is promised to believers. And so when you and I believe that, that gives us a statement, uh, it gives us uh, an indicator in that we believe in eternal life and that we uh, want to be there and want to be part of it. So it's the heart of the Easter story in seven little words. So believing in the resurrection did not come easy for the disciples. So Jesus appears to them and using a modern day little phrase and uh, cliche, he flattened the curve. Uh, he made it easier for them to believe rather than just hearing about it. He appears to them. And so uh, including the disciples and uh, it was a call for faith. And uh, again, performing miracles in that process as well. Are you walking through locked doors and uh, just transforming the disciples really was miraculous and the, the change, the shifts that take place. So the disciples called for an in-camera meeting or several of them. It was an urgent time and there were a lot of details uh, that needed to be processed, a lot of information that came through and uh, they had to struggle through the, this counterintuitive uh, information that they had. Dead people don't rise. And this was something that we today as well, we would basically say, you know, it's impossible, but Jesus did it. Furthermore, they also had to sort of process and struggle with the idea when that uh, first notice came through, the first wave of information came through, uh, through Mary Magdalene. Um, women didn't even have a right to vote uh, in a court of law. Their voice, their witness really didn't count. And so if this was just a concoction that the disciples had come up with, they would not have arranged it with Jesus to appear first, you know, to Mary Magdalene. It, it would just not have gone over culturally. And so the source was possibly something that they had to struggle with as well, so they didn't believe her. They had to overcome their own expectations and assumptions about the Messiah. Uh, they had struggled with that all along, even while Jesus was preaching and so on, this just did not fit their view of the Messiah. They wanted a king. They wanted a ruler. Uh, they wanted one who was strong and vindictive. And so they just couldn't. Others have suggested as well they struggled with this because it was just too much information. Uh, they had not had a lot of sleep. Uh, they had seen the crucifixion. And so their emotional state was unstable. And this was just too much to absorb. And so the world had collapsed the way they thought it was going to go. And they had declared bankruptcy and they were hurting. But now to absorb this idea that Jesus is risen just seemed too much. And so there was that side of it as well. Uh, 
the passage of scripture also talked about the fact that they were fear uh, fearful of the Jews, the fear of reprisal. Uh, they had seen the implications of when the Jews became angry and the leaders, they could do major harm, a major hurt on them. And so it was bad enough to follow Jesus and uh, then the pushback that had taken place there at that time. And now to again step forward and make another rash uh, statement that Jesus was uh, arisen. It seemed just too much. And uh, so this was just something. And how did this all fit into scripture? You know, they had to process that as well. So believing in Jesus' resurrection has been uh, and continues to be a major hurdle for people, not just for the disciples, but they overcame, they believed. But today, today people as well struggle with this uh, resurrection. And a lot of people reject Christianity basically because of this point. This is a critical mass to overcome, to, uh, to process. Uh, I, my sense is that some look for arguments against belief in the resurrection more so than they look for, for uh, reasons why to believe. And, you know, they deconstruct. There's a lot of people that just want to dismantle uh, faith, dismantle belief. At the core of their thinking, I sense is that if they wrap their minds around the resurrection of Jesus, then they, like Thomas, would have to say, my Lord, my God. And that just would not stack up with their lifestyle. They want to be sort of selfish and do it their way, do life their way. And um, they recognize that some things in life uh, would have to be dealt with and changed and given up. So looking for excuses uh, to not believe seems to be so much the pattern in our universities and uh, sort of the educators. Uh, no evidence really would convince them. Uh, they automatically resort to another excuse. If you come forward with a rationale, it just seems to knock that down. And it's a lifestyle. It's a way of thinking. They reject the resurrection just as they reject God as the creator as the virgin birth they just throw that out as well all miracles are either just legends or make-believes uh, just uh, stories or fables there are no miracles it's all just signs so coming to that many say that the resurrection just doesn't match a modern scientific view uh, they deny any possibility of divine intervention so th there's a dividing line of course that separates out those who whose understanding of a natural science leads them to deny any possibility of divine intervention in human history. And so it's just, just not allowable. There cannot be any intervention. Any, God does not exist. So miracles are ruled out in advance and apparently reliable claims to have experienced anything of this sort simply raise the problem of explaining how the witnesses were deluded. And so that the fact that the disciples believed they were just deluded. However, interesting enough, if they are deluded or hallucinated this, how can they hallucinate all at the same time? Uh, and they did it in separate places. They were not, you know, uh, hallucinating uh, at the same time. And generally one person who falls into a trance or whatever that basically takes place. Uh, others have uh, suggested or uh, raised the argument that the the storylines in the four Gospels, the narratives there surrounding the resurrection show uh, significant discrepancies. And many Christians have grown familiar with these passages without ever quite realizing how many discrepancies apparently there are. And so the questions are asked, so who went to the tomb and what did they see? And to whom did they, uh, the risen Lord appear? Uh, when and where and what manners and sequences and so on. And so these are narratives uh, that are in the Gospels. But um, I think it's important to recognize that just as in any story uh, that is recorded, um, whether it's the Free Press or the Sun or any other, you know, uh, article, a witness, they have different vantage points and different things are significant to record. But the fundamental storyline in all of the Gospels is that Jesus rose. And so if all witnesses at a trial said exactly the same thing, we uh, concluded was a co collusion. And that was one of the things that in a story, uh, typically, you know, you will have vantage points from their perspective. 
uh, Grant Osborne, a professor at uh, Trinity Seminary, uh, he says and he concludes that the biblical texts are valid as history because each gospel writer chooses to emphasize certain aspects of the Christian message. Material found in one account is ignored or abbreviated in the others. Ultimately, Dr. Osborne believes the texts are free of serious contradictions. Uh, to me, it's interesting talking to people as well and listening and reading some of their stories. Uh, some embrace the resurrection in a symbolic way. And that did Jesus literally rise from the dead in the body resurrection, as many of us and conservative Christians believe, traditionalists? Or was his rising a symbolic one, a restoration of his spirit of love and compassion to the world? And so that was just uh, taking and grabbing a hold of sort of the the motif, the, the energy, uh, the emotion of, of what Jesus did in his, his love and, and bringing that to the surface, the resurrecting that lifestyle. And so that is really what the resurrection is all about, just to bring that to life again. Uh, there's a German Protestant philosopher as well whose writings uh, are central in this debate, and he says the miraculous Easter event is the resurrection of faith in the cause of Jesus, not the resurrection of Jesus himself. And so uh, what has been stirred uh, is this faith, and it's not the historical investigation he uh, contends, but really it doesn't even matter at all whether Jesus rose or didn't. It's what Jesus did and accomplished. So uh, the uh, resurrection has been an issue. Uh, in 2010, the Barna poll showed that only 42% of Americans said the meaning of Easter was the resurrection. And so it's interesting also, even among pastors, how often do they preach on the resurrection? Once a year at best, because they struggle with the resurrection as truth. And so Jesus, uh, I think today is calling us again to don't doubt, but believe. Don't doubt, but believe. And uh, if you have a worldview that dead uh, people don't rise, and then to believe in the resurrection would be and is sort of a turnaround. It's, it's a conversion. It's, it's a change of, of focus. And so, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, that uh, it's Satan, uh, in many ways, the enemy of the gospel, enemy to humanity. He's a thief and a liar. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And so there is that piece as well. There's, there's you know, uh, interference. Uh, a, there's a blinding of the eye which comes. And um, Satan is one that is at work uh, over the years to try and cause people not to believe. So the disciples struggled, people in society struggled, but what a change happens when people, you know, do wrap their minds around it and accept that. And so the transformation of the disciples is, is significant. It's, it's proof of the resurrection itself. When people do believe in and of itself, there was such a significant uh, change uh, from being fearful they picked it up right then and there, the message of proclamation that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is risen, and their lives were changed. And so uh, interesting as well is that Jesus appeared only to those who were believers, kind of thing, the disciples and so on. So there were 515 people that did see Jesus, and there was confirmation, and it happened right where the crucifixion took place and uh, right in Jerusalem. And so people could very easily, you know, cross-examine. And this was right in, in their present front yard. And such appearances uh, were so profound that they transformed the disciples from cowardly people who were hiding in fear to be become bold witnesses and so on. And it's interesting when you think of, you know, again, how these lives were changed. Jesus says, why are you frightened? He says, why are your hearts filled with doubt? And look at my hands, look at my feet. And you can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see. Luke chapter 24. 
So as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. And still they stood there in disbelief, filled with mixed emotions, filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. And so Jesus wanted to go and flatten the curve. He wanted to invite people to believe it made eternal difference. And so the disciples all stood firm in their faith till their death. It's uh, over the years, you follow them and you read their stories. They were massac massacred or murdered or uh, became martyrs for their cause. And um, Thomas, the one that is talked about in, in John's gospel, became the first person to explicitly uh, acknowledge the divinity of Jesus. And he planted a church and did a significant church plant in India. And he was uh, killed uh, there. And Thomas is one of the greatest cases in the Bible of doubt, but also coming to powerful faith. And so he was martyred for his faith by be, uh, being run through with a spear. And um, at his monument in India, uh, they have a, a bunch of spears and so on at his monument just to indicate the kind of death. So uh, Thomas says uh, his action indicate that Jesus had to convince the disciples rather forcefully of his resurrections. They were not gullible people, predisposed to believing. They didn't want to exploit this. Uh, they resisted it. And so the point is they would not have fabricated it or hallucinated it since they were so reluctant to believe, even with the evidence they could see. And so there's a phrase that comes through several times. It's about peace. And I think that's the piece that we want to embrace. But again, let me just mention some things that can help us to, again, believe and wrap our minds around it. The execution of Jesus, the death of Jesus on the cross was witnessed by many, many people. It's, it's written in all kinds of historical records. And so the execution was very, very real. And it's not just recorded in the gospels, it's an historical fact. So the execution, itself is part of the evidence but then the next one is the empty tomb so uh, if jesus was not risen from the dead then present the body show me show us where is the body and so um, several instances it mentions in the scriptures that they knew exactly where the body was laid the empty tomb is a loud statement to the resurrection and then to later literally see and talk to Jesus gave this further credibility. Early accounts of his uh, resurrection are historically accurate. Um, the disciples started preaching shortly after. Most legends and fables and storylines of what you know typically is called a, a Christian faith legend kind of thing, uh, you know, a storyline like that would have taken place after years and years. But this one uh, was proclaimed just uh, shortly right after the resurrection. And they, you know, just the Gospels itself, it's interesting how people have tried to destroy the scriptures uh, to, uh, you know, take away the written proof and supernatural preservation of the documents as well. It's just something significant. Uh, as I mentioned before, there were well over 500 people that saw Jesus alive. Uh, to me, it's interesting as well that uh, the week changed uh, from, you know, starting with, you know, uh, Saturday and so on and, and uh, Sunday um, being the first day of the week, there was a shift of worship and so on. And so in the past, they, they uh, definitely worshiped on the Sabbath and that became a significant turning point and it's become Sunday. So peace is there available for us. Peace be with you. Allow this peace uh, to follow you. And I think belief is part of that. And so when, uh, when life is rough and struggling, uh, uh, issues take place, uh, just trust him. Uh, clarity comes with faith. Um, it's amazing that when we can embrace that which we already understand, those areas that we don't understand also fall into place thereafter. And so don't focus on that which you don't understand, but focus in on that which is truth and embrace that. And so for us as readers of the Gospels and believers here today, we are encouraged to weigh the evidence and make our judgments. 
Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and uh, he was before Herod, Ananias and so on. He was in trial then and today in some ways Jesus is standing before us on trial and you and I are making decisions about him. And so he is in challenging us and he's inviting us to believe and don't throw him under the bus. You know, don't reject him. Accept him for who he is. Come along with Thomas and say, my Lord, my God, accept him. And so Jesus did this for our salvation. Uh, he wants us to have eternal life. He loves us and he wants to do eternity with us. And so salvation is available for us in the present and also in the future. So Jesus rose from the dead and he's telling us if he can do that, he's got this. Uh, he is more than a conqueror and so in Christ we are more than conquerors as well. And so Paul makes this point. He says um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. So fundamentally, the resurrection is a significant, ongoing, year-round, 24-7, 365 reality for us. We can live in resurrection power. We can live with the presence of the living Lord. Jesus is not dead. He hears our prayers. So let me just close in prayer. And if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as Thomas did that day. If you've never done that and just says uh, to Jesus, my Lord, my God, invite him to come into your world, into your thinking, into your heart, into your lifestyle. Just invite him as your Savior and uh, talk to him. Speak to him. He's alive. He hears you. And uh, let me pray for you and for the whole community of Oak Bluff and so on, that we would just walk by faith and by courage. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have given us the scriptures uh, and you have um, touched the world um, by dying on the cross for us and then rising. And we just want to thank you that uh, you can give us today uh, salvation, life, forgiveness, hope, and a future. And that's your plan. And that's what you came into this world for. Um, the God of this age has blinded and has stolen. And there's so much crime and corruption that um, we see the evidences of, of the enemy at work. And so we believe that you came to redeem and restore. All creation is groaning as a result of, of sin. And so, Jesus, you came to roll back the stone, the, the enemy itself. And uh, we can live with hope and with anticipation. So, Lord, if there's anybody out there that does not know you as Lord and Savior, uh, may you just challenge them through your spirit, you know, uh, and say, uh, stop doubting and believe. And so, Lord, open our hearts and our minds to you. May we live in light of the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you. Take care. God's best. Bye.